Welcome to Maverick Dreamers and Thinkers. I'm Chloe Cho. In this age of disruption with a digital wave sweeping through the wealth management industry, how do traditional wealth managers survive, adapt, and prepare for a disrupted future, especially if you're running a small boutique private bank? Take a listen to this unique and insightful perspective from the fifth generation private banker and owner, Evhard Bordier, who runs the Asia operations of a family business that was founded nearly 180 years ago in Switzerland. Good morning, Evhard. How are you? Good morning, Chloe. How are you? <laughs> so nice to see you again. Oh, we're in your beautiful office in the Central Business District of Singapore. You are running the Asia headquarters of a boutique Swiss private bank called Bordier SCA. And it's something that was set up by your forefathers in 1844. Yeah, that's correct. Five generations ago, so a bit of time. I'm the fifth, my children are the sixth, and it's always, I think, the big distinctive element is that we are now still operating and owned by the family compared to a lot of institutions which still bear the name or have members of family as shareholders but that do not operate anymore the institution. From the outside perspective, you guys are dealing with high net worth individuals. You're certainly living the high life sort of in the leagues of billionaires and millionaires. What is that like? We are blessed and very privileged by, by having what we have. I think we try to teach our children to have the values and ethics that everybody needs. And I think money is just one component of life and does not, as we know, bring happiness in itself. Just as even the song goes, you know, I want to be a billionaire. That's sort of the new thing nowadays. People don't look at millions. They look at billions. And you have everything that you want. It's sort of the fairy tale life. But how do you do succession planning? How do you build on the family? name? How do you carry on a legacy? How do you make a difference when you have power, wealth and everything and just not scramble away your life? Five generation of being in the bank is wonderful, but it also is a huge weight uh, on your shoulder to ensure that you don't fuck it up, that you, <laughs> that you actually can make an orderly transfer to your next generation and you want your kids, which is one of the, I think, one of the common issues that wealthy individuals have is that you want your children to have a drive, right. the drive to succeed. You don't want to be wasting your assets that they grow to sit on their back and just do nothing and just squander the wealth. You want them to have this wish to produce, to create, to give back as well to society. And you know that very many wealthy individuals are giving back to society in a way or another. We try to give them education. You try to give them all the best you can do, but it's something very internal. I think you can train a little bit the drive, but it has to come from within. The single biggest challenge of running a family office, running a family business over the generations is about overcoming the egos, the strife, the personality clashes, and how you separate yourselves from that and rise above it. What are some of the lessons that you can share? I think conflict management is very, very important. You have to put your ego on the side and you really have to think for the benefit of the family and the benefit of your community in general, but really try to find a way that works well. With my brother, for instance, we do not walk on each other's territory. We really try to respect <laughs> each other's areas of expertise, respect the fact that people are better in certain areas than others, and try to really give them their say. We try also to work on a unanimous level so that there's never a situation where we do not agree. It's very Swiss because the Swiss are known for being compromising people. You often have to say, okay, you know what, I think I'll leave it to you and maybe we're making a mistake. I may have not the same view, but let's see what will happen and we can then decide otherwise and change the course of action based on decision taken. But the idea is not to be in conflict. Your brother and you are very much hands-on as far as the family business, this Bordier SCA private bank is concerned. He's running the European operations, you're running the Asia operations, so that is pretty clear. What I have learned from another family member who runs a sprawling business around the world is that they took all the family members out of direct managerial control because they just couldn't handle it anymore. There was so much strife, struggle, egos. So, And his advice was that if you hire uh, CEOs, managers who run the business, and the family members are distanced, not even on the board, 
but they just kind of like have this big brother status. For them, that was the solution. What do you think of that view? It's an, a path that people often take. The issues with that is that you're losing, obviously, then the control of the organization. You become a shareholder and maybe a big shareholder, but you do not have your right to say anything. So yes, it takes away the conflict, but then you don't have the fun of running the business anymore and calling the shots. <laughs> so I don't know. It goes both sides. <laughs> I think you have to be very mindful. And I think it's a lot about emotional intelligence and trying to really understand the other people. How do you get emotional intelligence when you were born with a silver spoon in your mouth? So I think you learn first, there's a lot of readings and lots of availability everywhere of people that have studied that more than us and from which you can learn. So I started meditation. I think a lot of people like uh, Ray Dalio will tell you that meditation has changed his life. And I do agree with uh, also this is a billionaire, right? A hedge fund manager. And that allows you to get a bit more peaceful and not react with your emotion on everything that happens. It allows you to take a better decision and try to improve your decision-making process by taking away the emotions of thoughts, feelings. At a time of supercharged growth of wealth in Asia, with China alone minting two billionaires per week, the region is witnessing a surge of family offices and wealth managers. But as the industry copes with the rising cost of running a business, there's been a lot of consolidation. A number of smaller foreign private banks have sold off their private banking divisions to Singapore's DBS and the Bank of Singapore, for example, as surviving in an increasingly competitive market comes down to scale. But Evhar has a different perspective in navigating Bordier Encia with $15 billion of assets under management through a turbulent era. We decided purposely not to become too big. We never went in public, we never expand our capital, we don't have loans, so we don't have debt with anybody. So we really tried to stay a small boutique institution because we wanted to be in the driver's seat as well. So do you want to expand? and be very large, and therefore you need debt and you need to expand, you are becoming you know, a bigger fish, or you want to be small and nimble, and for this you don't need other people's capital, you don't need to go public, and you control more. So we decided that we would not go in areas such as real estate or insurance, which we could have done to grow faster uh, and really focus on private banking, which is the area of expertise we're in, compared to other institutions. And there's no good way or bad way, but it's true that if you grow very large, then you automatically have to professionalize your board and you automatically lose family members, lose sight of operating the business and become in the end shareholders or name holders or part of certain business divisions of the group, but they don't really take ownership of everything. You have $15 billion of assets under management. In this world where there is so much competition for high net worth individuals, Morgan Stanley, Credit Suisse, UBS, you also have even Asian private banks trying to seize this supercharged growth market. How do you compete without scale? There's a choice that everybody has to make of whether they go for very large and very standardized processes and businesses, which is the game that the big players do, or being very tailor-made and very personal. And every client that has accounts with the UBS and the Credit Suisse also have accounts with us. If you're a billionaire or if you're a multi-billionaire, you will distribute your wealth to different organizations, and one of them is probably a smaller institution. We're doing very well. We're growing, I don't know, 10, 15, 20% every year. So it shows that being small makes sense. But it's challenging. It's very difficult. And often we are asked, why do you stay with a banking license? You could be a very big asset manager or you could be a family office. Yes. Why don't you transform yourself? So it's a discussion we're having, again, with the family of what do we want to become? Who do we want to be? The banking license, we use out of the license not a lot because as I said we do very little on credit. We could change, but we are probably more highly regulated and therefore it gives also stability to clients. It gives a certain sense of trust to people. So we never had the, the situation where we thought, oh my God, the situation financially is not good enough and we have to rethink the model. If we rethink the model is more on a growth perspective and how do we uh, challenge this. So being a very large family office is an option. But for now, I think we're quite happy to be an uh, institution with a bank license. We have three bank licenses, two asset management licenses, so we quite know the different elements of it. 
family offices are growing like mushrooms around the world because you have this exponential growth of wealth in the world of tech and so many other fields in Asia. Asia Pacific is set to overtake North America in terms of the number of high net worth individuals. This will happen in a matter of years. Give it five years, 10 years. For sure. That's why we're here. <laughs> <laughs> Asia may be the wealth creation hub of the 21st century, but as growing numbers of billionaires prefer to set up their own family offices, instead of letting private banks manage their wealth, how will the trend affect boutique private banks such as Bordia and Sia? China's Jack Ma of Alibaba and his right-hand man Joe Tsai are known to have distributed their vast combined wealth of about $50 billion across a number of family offices on the mainland while establishing their own family office called Blue Pool Capital. Because if all the billionaires start creating their own family offices, then it puts you in a bit of a difficult situation. At some point, what kind of decisions will you take? That's correct, but I think first, a lot of people are starting family offices when actually these are external asset managers, right? So we're having a confusion of what it is because the reality is paying per service is very difficult to do a family office where you pay by the hour will not yield you any revenues. But multifamily offices tend to very quickly go into asset allocation, investments, because that's where revenues are. So whilst external asset managers will try to morph into family offices by saying, we will take care of larger clients and look at larger percentage of their wealth and more elements of their wealth, such as succession planning, such as property purchase, etc., and art. Family offices do the reverse and they say, hey, we want to be doing some asset management as well because that's where the revenues are. So there's a sort of the line is shifting. I think for the family offices you mentioned, these are large single family office and that makes complete sense, right? People have enough wealth. They do not need to share anything. They can have their own lawyers, their own accountants, their own investment team. And often, as you say, there's a charitable component or a component to give back to society embedded into the family office. So I think these to me are separate from the others, which are sort of mid-tier wealthy individual, maybe with $100 million or 200 and they, it makes no sense to have a full-fledged family office for them, and therefore they're trying to go in those multifamily offices. I think the multifamily offices have banking needs as well, so there's always a connection where we can work together and really help each other achieving the goals of the families. Family offices, asset managers are having to delve into private markets, private equity investments, because where do you find the yield? Family offices are even going into startup investments because they're hoping to help the next generation of startup entrepreneurs also impact change by pushing for green investments, so on and so forth. But in this world of private equity investments, it's really now just becoming a very crowded space. Ten years ago, private equity investments totaled about a trillion dollars. Today, it's two trillion. You've got pension funds coming in with hundreds of billions of dollars. So as a family office or even an asset manager, a billion dollar ticket, you actually become the small shrimp. So how do you do it? Do you look at this? So it's a very interesting topic. And we are talking again with my brothers and the other partners. We're talking about private equity as an asset class. So from a bank perspective, we're really looking at it for clients. But often we realize that the clients that are with us historically do not do private equity with us. So it's a bit of training because they tend to be more in liquid and public markets. So the private markets is much more long term much more wait and, and see how it develops. And often people do not have that time of flexibility. And they tell you, oh yeah, I'm, I'm very long term. And then six months later, what's my performance? <laughs> Where's my money? I need the cash. Something happened. I'm getting a divorce. Yeah. So, <laughs> so <laughs> we have actually already uh, elements of our business that are in the private markets and it'll grow more and more. we would made a little platform with other banks to actually have bigger weight. So to answer your question, that's the way we do it. And then on a private level, I also personally invest into private markets because I think it's about, first it's super interesting. You meet extraordinary people and they have a real impact on society. I've just recently met someone from a Singapore company called Ardeon, which works in the immunology sector and healthcare. And it's super exciting what they're doing and how they want to try to treat some sicknesses that are today not curable. One of the things we're thinking of is building a separate offering for a separate client base. Instead of trying to take our existing client base and say, hey, you should go in private equity, is to say, 
we make a new offering specifically for people wanting to go in the private markets because it's really quite different. As I said, it's five, ten years, seven, ten years before you see. I personally go into founder shares, so more the small series, A series, instead of going later because I think then the ticket size, as you say, become bigger and bigger. Just as you are looking at going into private markets. So is everybody else. That's the challenge, and it really depends on where you see the PE cycle. A gentleman that I talked to the other day, who runs a huge private equity, he was saying their company had bet that the market had topped, in fact, in 2015, and became risk-free. And yet here we are today. Good deals are becoming scarce. How do you get the right deals? It's, it's very difficult. Where do you stand in the cycle, and how big you want to go, and how much? Efforts and resources you want to put in analyzing every deal and how do you source them? I think everybody today wants to be entrepreneur. My son、uh, is finishing his IB next year and he wants to be an entrepreneur. And I was thinking, oh my god, it's great to be an entrepreneur. Now you can go to university and you have courses on entrepreneurship. Actually, universities are, are dedicated to it and they give you funding to do your own business. So obviously, out of all this, a lot of businesses will fail, and you want to be funding the one that do not fail. And <laughs> and that's the difficult part, as I say, having. A systematic approach. I only invest into businesses where I really, really connect with the founders and love their business and love their focus and the vision that they have. Really trying to find something that is very transformative. What is transformative in your view? Technology and healthcare. I think these are the ones that will transform the world. As I said, I was mentioning this small startup before, and I think that's to me transformative. Is trying to help. Humankind and trying to ensure that you clear. You can see Bill Gates trying to clear malaria or trying to work with toilets, a toilet that is self-sufficient, that does not need electricity, that does not need water, that creates something better. I think it's an amazing project. I'm personally waiting on the sideline for a moment to see how it all pans out. The digital revolution is changing the way business is done across sectors, and the same thing for even finance and wealth management. You now increasingly have private banks. Big banks getting into fintech and data solutions. You are a high net worth individual managing other high net worth individuals' assets. Are you thinking about adopting some of that data analytics, AI, digital wealth management into your platform? We're constantly looking at how we can evolve and transform. I think that's the key: is that you need to see the next curve, right? You need to see where are we going and where are we heading, and not missing it, the curve, because otherwise, it's for business, it's catastrophic. So, looking ahead and analyzing all the elements, we do that constantly. But as I said, some elements like blockchain, I could try to integrate blockchain in my instead of my back office, right? I don't need the back office; it would streamline, probably make ninety percent savings. Are you doing it now or not yet? No, we're. Not because again, this is too early. I think that we are not at that stage yet. The processes of custodizing assets is well entrenched in the financial sector and give security to clients. Now, if I tell them that their securities is held on blockchain, I have to bloody ensure that it's there when they need it and when they want to sell it. So there's a lot more time, effort to be put and understanding, but also getting the market to mature. I think new companies have just emerged that do proper institutional. Custodizing of assets, tokenized assets. One of them is Signum. It's a Swiss bank that was just being given FINMA licenses and MAS. They've got a CMS license as well, and they are going in that route. So it's for cryptocurrency, but it's also for tokenized assets. And I think that's a very, very interesting future because it would mean that people would not need to go on IPO anymore. They could actually raise funding elsewhere in the market without the cost of going public and tokenize assets. That Could today not be done. So you see, these are very interesting evolutions. So instead of taking and being the first one, we want to see a bit more. I think we're also a small family business. The big boys can come first. So as an example, UBS can put 50 million to develop a website when we are at the beginning of the internet. But today, building a website is nothing. Right? Missing a year or two、uh, is not a problem. <laughs> Missing the curve is a problem. <laughs> The next curve that'll transform the wealth management industry, according to Evgar, is blockchain and its smart contracts in the form of tokenizing assets. He says Bordia and Cia is only dipping its toes in at the moment, but the attorney turned banker and entrepreneur believes that blockchain technology will be transformative in an era where banking secrecy gives way to greater tax transparency. Other technologies, such as automation and digital banking, he says, will probably get acquired by banks, 
and that it'll be quite common in the years to come for people to manage up to a couple million dollars in an app, while figures above $10 million will require personalized wealth management solutions with that human touch. At the FinTech Festival recently in Singapore, there was a lot of discussion over the future of finance. And I think some people actually believe that this notion of standalone banks will disappear in a matter of time. And that uh, one day people are going to say, oh, you know, uh, you know, 30 years from now, 20 years from now, do you know that once upon a time there were these things called banks? Because everybody will be using super apps. In this kind of environment where people, especially the millennials and under, are happy to put their wealth in an app, how does that affect your planning? So you're right. I mean, they will transform. I mean, the next banks are not the HSBC. It's the Apple and it's the Google and it's Alibaba. So it's very obvious that they will reap incredible rewards, especially with these now soft credit cards and digital payment systems. Will we be able to survive? Obviously, I think we will. Otherwise, I obviously would not be there and continue the business we're doing. We will probably transform the business, right? There's a level, I think, up to which you will trust an app. And then you want to talk to an individual at one point. So today, maybe a million dollar, maybe a limit where you feel, okay, I need to talk to an individual. And that, I think, will change, meaning that the limits where people will feel comfortable will probably raise to 5 million, maybe 10 but if you have 20 million, do you really want to trust 20 million dollars on an app, right? We need to, as you say, use and, and partner for the lower end segments and say, look, we want to automate everything and then give access to the younger generation to an app like Revolut, like all these and 26, right? You have access to very easy process of your funding, but for a certain level, then you want to have a different kind of approach. Now, would it use technology? For sure. Will we use AI and, as I said, blockchain? And for sure, we will. We have to transform. But I think there will always be a case where you want to be having someone to talk to. It's like a restaurant. It's not because McDonald's is here that you don't have five-star Michelin. Will you say that all the Michelin stars will go away? No, what we see in practice is that more and more chefs are trying to do smaller tables, maybe do actually give away their Michelin star and really want to give, be passionate about what they're doing and deliver a beautiful food to their clients. And okay, that's a little bit where we are as well. As much as Evrard believes that digital banking will in fact lead to a thriving marketplace for boutique private banks such as his, he notes that the speed of transformation is getting faster and faster, making it absolutely critical for entrepreneurs to understand the next curves in innovation. He adds that while there might have been one curve per generation in his father's time, there will be probably two or three in his lifetime something he did not anticipate when he took over from his father, a bank in the Caribbean in 2001, at the age of 33. Just a year later, his father passed away from a heart attack. He had a heart attack and just, I spoke to him the day before and then he was gone the next morning. I had just started to work with him about 20 years ago and it was so sudden and then I became the only one who operated because it was a small institution in the Caribbean and I was suddenly the owner and operator of it and I was at that time not with my family because my father had split the businesses in different segments and I took one part which had nothing to do with my brothers and the main business in Switzerland and it was pretty much of a shock because suddenly I had to go and see every client and say, hey, are you comfortable to be with me at the younger generation? There's nobody else. He passed away. And I remember seeing my oldest client and I told her, you know, are you okay? And she said, but you know, I was with your great grand uncle. So what are you talking about? It's the third generation. So I've got no issue. <laughs> so that gives a lot of comfort. And you think, okay, having a long-term business family has also its advantages. Do you sometimes think, will genes pass through and will my life end in my 60s? Or do you not think about that? I actually do think about it. I actually vouch. So my father stopped working day to day at 57 and it plays on my mind. On when should you stop taking a different seat or a different angle to the business? But 57 is so young. And it is, especially that now the lifespan. Yeah, people are living, going strong at 90, 100, 110, 120. We have people people in Malaysia running a country in the 90s, right? <laughs> so. 
That bank, called Bordier International Bank and Trust Limited in the Caribbean, was later integrated into Bordier and Sia in 2010 when Evrard joined the family business and established the Asia office in Singapore. As Evrard ponders when he should retire given the precedent set by his father, he believes in living his life to the fullest. You're right, the lifespan is growing, but I think I'm an entrepreneur and I will never stop. Meaning it's something that I will, even if I leave the bank on a day-to-day -day operational matter and become a chairman or something, I will still continue, as you say, your private equity ventures or helping businesses grow in the region. So it's a matter of when do you take that turn? And it plays on my mind because you always think life is finite and, and we never know when it happens. So we have to make the most of it now. And so I'm a very big believer of living at 100%. And I'm striving every day to get to that. As much as you believe in Carpe Diem, does that mean that you will remarry? One of the elements I moved out of my marriage was because of that, because I felt I didn't get all I wanted and maybe I didn't express it properly for whatever reason. But it, that was one element that made me want to try to strive for more, right? Will you plan to remarry? I think the institution of marriage is beautiful. I think it's wonderful and I really think it's a beautiful environment. I've never understood why governments have not moved forward as technology has moved. We could, you know, we, no, but you could do smart contracts on marriage. We should be able to map out all the outcomes of a marriage because we're whole human beings and we all go through the same thing. So I don't understand why. I mean, there are prenups nowadays. Yeah, but uh, in Singapore, it's not really valid. So my prenup didn't really work in Singapore. So you can plan a little bit, but I think it's very, uh, let's take Singapore, for example, you get married in three minutes and it takes three years, right? Or four years to get divorced. So why is that such a disconnect between the reality? I think it's great for the government to try to promote marriage as an institution, but I think it's a bit outdated to have to wait so long when we both realize that it's, you know, it's not working out as it should. Possibly. I will possibly remarry. I have to find the right partner. Where do you see yourself? Do you let fear overtake you, overwhelm you? Because I've seen that among people. And it's a psychological barrier. You know, my mom passed away from breast cancer at the age of, you know, da 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 therefore I will have it. These fears actually end up becoming a self-fulfilling prophecy if you keep on repeating them. Do you let that dictate you, your life? No. So I'm convinced about this. I'm convinced that whatever you repeat yourself, we have the, all these 60,000 thoughts a day. And if you constantly repeat yourself the same things and they come back, these thoughts, it will happen. It will have an impact. So I purposely go against that. So I train much more. I think your physical health is very, very important. And I try to do this idea that someone mentioned of the Centennial Olympics. So the idea is to say, what do you need to do today to be in a good shape when you're 90 to 100, right? So I think people mistakenly train when they're in their 30s, 40s. I think they should start training at 50. <laughs> And uh, that's what Giorgio Armani said, right? He said, I didn't do anything until the age of 50 because I was so taken by business. But from the age of 50, I started to train regularly. And you can see how incredibly uh, his physique is today, right? And your muscle mass can grow anytime. So you shouldn't train for your 40s. You should train for your 90s, right? Today, as you say, people will be good until the age of at least 70. No problem. But then it starts to fall down. Very important to go against this idea that whatever you had and happened to you in the past will happen again. It's a recurrence, it's a curse for your family. It actually not, it's not the case. You are in power of your own life. So where do you get the drive? You don't need to work. I want to create, I want to deliver, I want to be here talking to you, I want to be helping businesses along, growing my own business, having incredible connection with clients and people around me, giving back to society. All this comes naturally for me. How do I build this for my next gen? How do I make sure they're not little entitled brats? And I say to myself, you know, you should study more because, you know, you should get that drive. And they don't do anything. They are looking at Do TV. they have the drive like you? It's very difficult to say, right? I think first because they're teenagers. So it's difficult with the teenagers to determine whether it has a drive or not. Right? And so you want to have a balance between the book smart and the street smart. I think now... I believe that you can train it, and I think it needs discipline. Does it matter whether your kids 
take part in the family business? Oh, no, no, no. It doesn't matter at all. Do they want to be part of it? For now, my children, no. None of them. Oh, my, my younger son, but he was young. I said, he said, uh, what well, do you want to be later? He says, I want to be an artist. And if not, I want to be a banker. So you know, that's a quite a big difference. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> for the moment, nobody has mentioned anything. I think it's also much too early. We want people, I think it's a meritocracy. We are about 100 and more than 100 people in the family. And only the people that really, really want to do it and have the capability and are chosen can come. So we're giving the choice to anybody. My brother's children, my nephews, are studying in the field of economics. So it could be. We'll see. It takes time. Hope you enjoyed this candid conversation with Evard Bordier, the fifth generation of boutique Swiss private bank Bordier and Sia, who believes in seizing control of his own life and destiny. Thank you so much for tuning in to Maverick Dreamers and Thinkers. Do subscribe and give us a quick review. If you're on social media, do reach out and share what you think of the podcast. Stay tuned for another fascinating episode next week. To all the great dreamers out there, I'm Chloe Cho. Take care and happy holidays.